Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, first of all, for braving this weather. This is very far away. For braving this weather and coming and joining us tonight. Um, I hope that you are warm and comfortable and settled in. Uh, my name is Deborah Popowski. I am the executive director of the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice here at NYU School of Law. And on behalf of our center and our co-hosts, the International Center for Transitional Justice and the rest of the NYU law community, I want to say thank you and welcome to the, this year's Emilio Mignoni Lecture. Before I move to substance, um, a few points of order. Hopefully you all have a program and you can see the full agenda there, but we will, we're starting a little bit late, but we're still gonna probably, probably no one will run shorter <laughs> than they intended to. Um, but you'll see that we do, um, our guest Pablo de Greif will be speaking for about 40 minutes and following his lecture, there will be a robust, we hope, period for um, engagement with all of you in the room um, and an opportunity to ask questions and engage. And um, the program will end with a reception around eight o'clock. I've been also been asked to call your attention to our hashtag for this event. It's hashtag EM lecture. Um, so those of you who are on Twitter, please go ahead and tweet um, any piece of this that is of interest. And um, also, just so that you know, this event is being recorded. And if I speak over here, can you still hear me? Yes? OK, great. Um, this event is being recorded, and it's also being live streamed. So please um, keep that in mind. So I am delighted and also moved uh, to deliver the welcome this year in particular, um, as it's a special year, I think, for a few reasons. One, it's the 10th lecture. And knowing that it was the 10th lecture as we were preparing pushed us, as milestones tend to do, uh, to pause and reflect on where we are where we've been and where we're headed. Hence the genesis of tonight's theme, the future of the past, in which we'll be asked to look backwards, then forward, and then back again, in order to make sense of how to live with our present. It's also special because we have members of the Mignoni family here with us tonight, and uh, having them here gives us an opportunity to really reconnect with the person and the family whose legacy we honor through this series and on whose shoulders we stand. Uh, the chance to meet and share this moment with, with you, Isabel and Mario, holds personal meaning for me as an Argentinian human rights lawyer. Um, I was born in Buenos Aires in 1979 under military rule, but my family left in 1982. And growing up in my household, there wasn't much discussion about the Proceso, um, but there was this copy of Nunca Mas, 1985 edition, that sat on their bookshelf. And I got my hands on it at a very young age. I realize how young now that I'm a mother. Um, and looking back, I can draw a really clear line between my desire to make sense of the testimonies and the maps and the lists that I discovered through this book and the work that I do today. And that learning involved really steeping myself in the work of your parents, uh, Emilia and Chela Mignone, and the movements and institutions they helped build. And finally, it's a special year because tonight we're celebrating and paying tribute to another there he is, brilliant and beautiful soul, my colleague, friend, and a person whom I deeply respect, Pablo de Greif. You will be hearing shortly from Fernando about Pablo's tremendous contributions to the field. So for now, I'm only allowed to say a little. Um, and I'll say that only in addition, in addition to his public work, Pablo has directed um, our Center's Transitional Justice Program since 2014, and in that role has taught and advised dozens of NYU law students and enriched CHRGJ's programs with his expertise. Pablo is also one of the kindest people I've ever worked with, and I am not alone in feeling this way. Earlier today, at lunch, another colleague used unprompted exactly the same words to describe him. Um, he approaches everyone with a humility and a respect that is rare for a man of his level of formal learning and professional stature. And I have learned as much from his sensitivity and humanity as I have from his experience. So Pablo, I just wanna take this moment to thank you on behalf of all your CHRGJ colleagues and students. It brings us tremendous joy to mark your contributions to the field with this lecture tonight.
so the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice and the ICTJ have been close partners for going on two decades now. Our relationship dates back to the days when Alex Boren led the ICTJ. Alex, who was deputy chair of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, also taught at NYU from 1998 to 2001 and served as the inaugural director of its transitional justice program. And that partnership then continued with Paul Van Ziel and now Pablo. And this lecture became a flagship event for both organizations. Uh, it was designed to capture and advance the public understanding of the field, to honor and learn from those who have been carving out new space in it and pushing us to think creatively, critically, and constructively about how to repair and even more importantly prevent human-created atrocity. Last year, we hosted Sherilyn Eiffel and Darren Walker from the NAACP Legal and Educational Defense Fund and the Ford Foundation, respectively, who led us in a thought-provoking and necessary conversation on the legacy of slavery in the United States and whether and how transitional justice concepts could contribute to dismantling enduring structural racism. Other guests have included Hassan Bagat of the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights, then UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Zaydrad Al Hussein and Helen Clark, to name just a few. So, given the goals of this lecture, it's not surprising that those who conceived of it would have chosen to name it after Emilio Fermin Mignone, one of the most influential lawyer advocates of his generation, whose documentation, litigation, institution building, writing, and personal advocacy helped define this field into being. He and his wife, Angelica Sara Mignone, or Chela, had a profound impact on human rights in Argentina and beyond. Together with others whose children and loved ones had been disappeared, they founded the CELS, the Centro de Estudios Legales y Sociales, an organization that in the thick of the dictatorship performed astonishing work documenting disappearances and went on to become one of the leading human rights NGOs in the region. This is only one of many institutions and movements that they touched. Tela was a notable human rights advocate in her, in her own right. She was a co-founder of Madres de Plaza de Mayo and was part of the first delegation of mothers to travel internationally to denounce the regime. And then there was Monica, whose own human rights commitment as a social worker and teacher working with people living in poverty was so strong, whose commitment was so strong that it was seen as a threat to the junta. It was her kidnapping at age 24 that led Emilio and Chela down the path that we now know them for. But in revisiting interviews and writings to prepare for tonight, I was struck by Monica's own fire and the beauty and fierceness in it. And I also learned that Chela in her youth had done work similar to that, that Monica was doing at the time, and then a fuller picture of the family's courage and conscience began to take shape for me. So it's impossible and rather painful um, in a matter of minutes to even try to begin to do justice to the legacy of this family and the grief and loss that underpins it. But we hope that just bringing their spirit into the room gives you a window into the story behind the, this particular program and why we value it so much. I now have the lovely pleasure of introducing you to Fernando Travesi, Executive Director of the ICTJ. Fernando has over two decades of experience in transitional justice, human rights, and rule of law. His geographically and thematically diverse range of experience is dizzying. Um, he joined the ICTG in 2014. Before then, he was with the UNDP as director of the Transitional Justice Basket Fund in Colombia and a senior justice advisor, advisor in Tunisia. He has worked for the ICRC in Nepal and Colombia, for the Spanish Red Cross in Sierra, Sierra Leone, and for Movimiento for la Paz as regional director for the Balkans and as country director in Albania during the Kosovo War. Fernando is also a lawyer, a visiting professor at universities in several countries, and here's my favorite part about him, is also a practicing novelist and playwright, because why not, whose many awards include the prestigious Spanish National Theater Prize. So thank you. Join me. Thank you, um, everybody. Thank you for being here. Good night. Um, <clears throat> I just want to take a few minutes to uh, reflect on uh, Emilio Mignone's legacies in Argentina, but also we could think about Syria, Yemen, Venezuela, the Gambia, Colombia, Tunisia, Central African Republic, Armenia, Myanmar. 
When we read the newspapers uh, each morning or when we watch the evening news, we are often confronted with human tragedy, with the pain and the suffering that always accompany mass violence around the world. Armed conflicts, political repressions, authoritarian regimes, dictatorships, they all invariably leave behind a long trail of human rights violations. Frequently, this trail is so long and it reaches so vast that it takes decades or even generations to address the impacts and overcome the consequences of such dark and disturbing legacies. Mass atrocities and systematic abuses devastate families, whole communities, and entire societies. The lives of thousands, hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions, are brutally cut short or shattered completely. Political, legal, and social institutions such as parliaments, the judiciary, the security forces, and education systems are left severely weakened, unstable, or politicized if they have not completely collapsed. The social contract, that is the unspoken public trust we have in each other and in our institutions to govern according to the rule of law, is perhaps one of the greatest invisible casualties. Because although we often take it for granted, this shared trust, this belief in the rule of law is very fragile and can easily crumble. Once destroyed, however, restoring this trust among citizens and between citizens and the state is a complex and multi-layer process that requires numerous strategies, consistent efforts and investment, and not least of all, patient and time. In the unforgiving new cycles in which we live, we are often exposed, at least for a few minutes, to the heartbreaking images of violent conflict and its repercussions. Waves of displayed families and refugees desperately seeking safety. Indiscriminate and deadly attacks on civilians, including children. Civilian targets, such as schools or hospitals, victims of chemical or forbidden weapons, systematic suppression of political opponents or groups that are often already marginalized or excluded for racial, religious, or other reasons. We get glimpses of the human beings caught up in these tragic circumstances. We hear sound bites of their testimonies. Some of them suffered illegal detention, unspeakable torture, sexual or gender-based violence. Many others lament the loss of family members or anxiously wait news of relatives who are missing or were forcibly disappear. Regrettably, the voices and rights of victims are frequently drawn out and overlooked in the loud and confusing cacophony of polarizing narratives, propaganda, and fix fixated and superficial ideological positions that often supplant respect for the most basic human rights. But once the spotlight of any particular emergency fades out, once the news cycle turns its attention away from the victims, what happened to them? How are they able to cope and rebuild their lives? How do they get any redress or acknowledgement? What happens to the perpetrators of the crimes or other people responsible for those crimes? How can members of these societies come to terms with the legacies of abuse? How can they reconcile with their neighbors and with the state that instead of defending and protecting their rights, targeted or attacked its own citizens? Anyone who has sat down with victims and listened to their personal stories understands that coping with the consequences of serious human rights violation is a lifelong challenge. If we want to break the cycles of violence, if we want to achieve peace and justice, there is no way to do so without addressing the root causes of conflicts and victims' demands for justice. Nowadays, the world has agreed to a global agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, as a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. While the agenda provides a framework for eradicating poverty and hunger, combating climate change, providing education for all, and ensuring gender equality, it also calls for sustainable peace and for just and inclusive societies, which at the end of the day, 
are the required foundation to pave the way toward achieving all the other goals. In countries devastated by conflict and massive human rights violations, the challenges to create such peaceful, just and inclusive societies with access to justice for all could not be greater. And to do so requires long-term engagement and the design and implementation of sustainable, tailored, multifaceted approaches and measures. And that is what we do at the International Center for Transitional Justice. For almost 20 years, ICTJ has worked in more than 50 countries to help put an end to cycles of violence, exclusion, and impunity. We work with civil society organizations, with government representatives, and with the international community to bring redress to victims, to reestablish the rule of law, to build just and inclusive institutions, and help societies to find their way to address the legacy of a troubled and violent past. We have always taken a rights-based approach in our work as we never lose sight of the value of justice as a principle in itself. The importance of victims' dignity and the rights to truth, reparation, and accountability. We often begin to work when a conflict is ongoing and we stay long after it has ended. Transitional justice is about all these social, political, legal, ethical, and philosophical dilemmas that we confront in the aftermath of atrocities and massive violence. It is about the hard questions that we have to answer as individuals and as a society to deal with a violent past. What are the root causes of that violence? Who has the greatest responsibility? How can they be held accountable? How can victims be acknowledged and repaired? How can we move forward? How will we reconcile and live again together in a society where everyone enjoys their rights? These questions are not new. They have always been there, and the world has, has, asked, has had to ask them many, many times. And perhaps one of the merits of transitional justice is bringing all of these questions together. If there is someone who has helped finding answers to these questions and who has shaped the field of transitional justice is our speaker of tonight. He directs the transitional justice program at Erwan-U Center for Human Rights and Global Justice. Until very recently, he has served for, for six years as the first UN Special Rapporteur on the promotion of truth, justice, reparation, and guarantees of non-recurrence. Since the very foundation of ICTJ until 2014, he was also the director of, res of research at the International Center for Transitional Justice, and he's still a distinguished member of its advisory board. He holds a BA from Yale University, a PhD from Northwestern University. And beyond his numerous books, publications, articles, lessons on this matter, he has accumulated decades of practical experience, advising and following very closely transitional justice processes and bodies around the world. Peru, Guatemala, Morocco, the Philippines, Colombia, where he was born, and during his term as a special reporter, he conducted country visits to Uruguay, the United Kingdom, and Northern Ireland, Tunisia, and Spain, and Burundi and deliver more than a dozen reports to the Human Rights Council and the UN General Assembly. Besides, he's a vital resource to countless victims, organizations, and institutional focus on transitional justice, gender issues, and development. But more importantly, he's a great gentleman, he has a great heart, and a long life commitment for justice. He's an example for all of us. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to introduce the professor, the activist, the colleague, and the friend, Pablo de Grave. I am uh, more touched uh, than I can say by the two extraordinarily generous uh, introductions, about which uh, I always feel a bit of ambivalence because they almost always guarantee that what follows is a total disappointment. <laughs> so <laughs> it also reminds me of uh, 
uh, in a much less friendly setting uh, after I had been appointed uh, the first um, uh, special rapporteur on transitional justice. And it was an academic setting to discuss uh, what in the title was mentioned uh, as the transitional justice industry. Someone uh, told me, and you are the CEO. <laughs> and that was not meant as a compliment. <laughs> so, uh, in any case, I am more grateful than I can say for this uh, huge, uh, huge honor. I am uh, honored and uh, very, very humbled uh, by the invitation. Uh, the list of speakers, as uh, has been mentioned, that preceded me is an incredibly, incredibly distinguished one. I have learned uh, a lot from them and from many people in the audience. And I cannot go through each of those, but of course, I would like to say that I have learned a lot from very long-term partners in transitional justice debates, even when it was not originally their own field, but eventually they agreed to participate with me in them. And I learned a lot, uh, Margaret Walker, who is uh, here and was an, an early participant in a, a research project. Sam Isaharov from NYU, who is an expert on transitional justice and agreed to participate in a project that I organized when I was new at the ICTJ, Jim Goldstone. Stephen Rapp, there are too many of you to recognize, but Hani Megali, a long, long-term colleague at the ICTJ. So again, it's, uh, there are too many people from whom I have learned too much to list you individually, but it is a great pleasure to be here. We have not only started late, uh, I would also be very interested in having a conversation, so I will try to keep my remarks well below the 40 minutes that uh, Deborah mentioned. But in any case, going back to the honor and to the very distinguished people who preceded me in this podium, I am absolutely sure, and I know this for a fact, that part of the reason why they accepted the original invitation was because of the Mignone name in the lecture. Uh, this is a name that is extraordinarily important in the transitional justice field. I think that the family, uh, through what I take to be absolutely heroic efforts, took the pain of the abduction of one of the five children in order to reinforce activism and commitment that they had started long before and did and made the contributions that were also mentioned and that I will not repeat here before. But Emilio ended up establishing cells uh, along with uh, uh, Angelica. Angelica went uh, to become one of the original members and founding members of uh, the Mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, and uh, in this way had a huge, huge uh, impact on the Argentinian transition, and subsequently in uh, other transitions uh, around the world. So it is an honor for me to be here, and I am very grateful that uh, Isabel and Mario, the author of an excellent biography of Emilio and his family, are uh, here tonight. Uh, thank you very much. I also would like to take a few seconds to recognize uh, the passing of Alex Borain uh, last uh, December 5th. Alex, as was mentioned also, was a, a Methodist minister, a, poly, a member of parliament in South Africa, who resigned in 1986 his seat because of the all-white nature of the South African parliament, went on to establish IDASA, the Institute for the development of alternatives for South Africa, which was very, very important in providing conceptions of how the South African transition could proceed, including in the transitional justice field, 
was appointed by President Mandela, the deputy chair of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and then subsequently came to NYU, eventually to establish uh, the ICTJ. So it is true that in the transitional justice uh, world, we stand uh, on the shoulders of uh, giants. And uh, I think that it is that sort of determination, if I may be allowed a personal comment, that inspires me and my energy. And I always think about families who have suffered what some of them have suffered. And I say, every day they get out of bed and they take care of life. And beyond taking care of life, they maintain the struggle to achieve justice, justice which most of them have never received by their own systems. And if they do not give up, we cannot give up. So my respect to all of you and my gratitude for the example. So I would like in my brief comments to divide the intervention in three different parts. Uh, the first one, some preliminary remarks in order to situate my talk, and then two further parts. One, trying to outline some of the achievements of the field of transitional justice, and in the final part, uh, to sketch some of the challenges that I think uh, that the field uh, is uh, facing. So let me start with the preliminary remarks. And I am now of this age in which I have to choose between seeing my paper or seeing you. <laughs> and I think it is better if I can see my paper. So let me get my... <laughs> okay. This should help me get through the 155 pages sooner. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. So. so I have proposed to talk uh, about the future of the past, meaning, of course, the future of dealing with the past, which is another way of referring uh, to transitional justice. Uh, we should keep in mind that, for example, the German Ver uh, Vergangenheitsbewältigung, working through the past, long preceded uh, the term uh, transitional justice. Before talking about the future, I would like to make a few introductory remarks uh, to situate my talk and then to divide my intervention, as I mentioned, into two further parts. The second, on what I take to the field to have accomplished, followed by one on some of the important challenges it faces. In thinking about the future of dealing with the past, perhaps one should take solace from the fact that a problematic past, by, me, by which I mean one which includes massive and systematic violations and abuses, does not go away. This has been tried, in fact. It does not work. The persistence of the past is obvious, but I actually think that it deserves much more systematic attention than it has received. Most work on transitional justice simply takes it for granted that the past does not go away. And while this is true, I think that much more needs to be said. It would help us understand what we are trying to achieve, which is essential for doing it better, something that I think we urgently need to do. One should say to begin with that in doing transitional justice, uh, which by the way I understand as a comprehensive policy that has been implemented in order to deal with the legacies of massive and systematic violations and abuses and to restore the or to establish anew the currency of uh, human rights, a policy that has as its core truth, justice, reparations, and guarantees of non-recurrence. In doing transitional justice, one is trying to achieve a minimal sense of justice. 
Transitional justice, as all justice and rights related work, rests, f at least from my standpoint, on a deontological base. We try to achieve justice because it is the right thing to do, because we owe it to the victims and to others as a matter of right. Justice, from my standpoint, is not merely one more good to be plotted in an indifference curve. Justice is supposed to be part of the framework which gives meaning to the very exercise of drawing indifference curves. This is, however, true for justice in general, not for particular justice programs. The latter cannot be indifferent to consequences, to costs, and to impacts. And here, I think it is important to be modest. Like it has been said of peace agreements, I think that transitional justice is not meant to take people to heaven, it is meant to take people out of hell. I am happy to elaborate on the importance of modesty later on. Transitional justice, I want to insist, is not a universal policy tool, a cure for all sorts of maladies. It is a small, albeit important, part of a broader tran uh, transformative agenda. But the question remains about the amazing endurance of the past, the fact that it does not go away, that, for example, efforts to bribe people by offering them economic development instead of justice may work for a while, but only that, for a while. In an article that I wrote now, almost 20 years ago, I put the point in the following terms. There are things that we cannot reasonably expect our fellow citizens to forget. To simplify greatly, <laughs> this is simply a function of our ability to learn. Elsewhere, I developed a bit some aspects of the phenomenology of victimhood in order to explain some of the effects of the massive and systematic rights violations, the effects that they leave in their wake, including a sense of isolation, social fragmentation, and civic mistrust, effects that manifest themselves multi-generationally, as some of them um, you, but particularly Yael Daniele, has worked in. So be that as it may, the first point I would like to stress is that in many ways dealing with the past is not an option. In the early days of transitional justice, Spain and Mozambique were often used as counterexamples. I always thought that this was inept that although neither country had appealed to the, to the traditional transitional justice mechanisms, both had in fact done significant work on their past through other means. Now, it is even harder to use these two countries uh, as counterexamples because they are in fact experimenting with the familiar transitional justice uh, at some point or another, although one must acknowledge that it usually takes longer than we originally thought, a reckoning becomes inevitable because the legacies of violations become unbearable morally, psychologically, culturally, and even developmentally. Now, if enthusiasts of transitional justice can take some solace from the fact that dealing with the past is eventually inevitable, as Faulkner in his Requiem for a Nun said, the past is never dead, it is not even past. No one, however, should be complacent. The world, as a recent report in The Economist put it, is fixated on the past. We are, it seems, going through a fit of nostalgia. But these are not the worries about the past that I want to address here. There is, I think, a good paper to be written about the resurgence of grievances of old empires. But obviously, these are not the core of my work. 
nor will they be the subject of my talk tonight. Although I have to confess that they do keep me up at night frequently, for geopolitically, those grievances are potentially quite dangerous. Redressing human, massive human rights violations is not made easier, however, in the context of the type of nostalgia that is sweeping many countries, including powerful ones like where we find ourselves. Which brings me to the last three very brief preliminary points which make work on human and justice related work, including work on transitional justice, significantly more challenging today than say in the early 2000s when things looked very bright indeed. There is no question that the task is much more difficult today by the great selectivity in the implementation of human rights norms, by the tendency to securitize all sorts of topics as if they were existential threats that justified emergency measures left and right, <coughs> and by what has been called the closing of civic space. There is no question that in a context in which the very vocabulary of human rights has lost a lot of its traction, and which even within the United Nations, the guardian of human rights covenants, the term is now largely avoided in preference for substitutes such as equality, non-discrimination, and even more distantly, in favor of framing arguments in developmental terms, talking about transitional justice is much more difficult than it used to be. So, preliminary remarks now. And yet, I do not think that we should lose sight of the field's great accomplishments. I will skip without much remark the fact that the field managed to consolidate itself despite the centrifugal forces that characterized its beginnings as the beginnings of most of the fields that defend the implementation of a plurality of measures. Not because I do not consider the consolidation of the field to be an accomplishment, but because I have remarked upon it many times before, including in an effort to work out what it means precisely to think about the field holistically, a claim that is often made but seldomly explained. Nor will I linger on the fact that the field has become a field academically in terms of practice as an object of international cooperation for similar reasons. And finally, I will understate the normalization of the field, the fact that it is now a normal expectation for states that are undergoing various forms of transitions to implement these measures. But this last point we should not underestimate. Achieving normative change in a relatively short period of time around 30 years is a huge accomplishment. I will describe the accomplishments of the field in the following terms. Transitional justice has unpacked and in that sense helped to give richer content to the notion of justice that is relevant in the wake of massive and systematic violations and abuses. The very least of constituent futures, not merely criminal justice, but reparations, truth, and guarantees of non-recurrence manifests this. But one can go further. Transitional justice has helped to entrench rights to justice, truth, and reparations that 30 years ago were largely fictions for the overwhelming majority of victims of human rights violations and abuses. And it has done it not only doctrinally, but also importantly, practically. In the justice domain, for example, by teaching countries how to cope with amnesties, with issues of retroactivity, with statutes of limitations, by developing prosecutorial strategy 
and by helping to give the international community incentives to create a variety of forums, hybrids, international tribunals, in which those cases can be tried. In the domain of truth, by the introduction of truth commissions, commissions of inquiry, and other investigatory tools. In the domain of reparations, by introducing massive administrative reparation programs with complex benefits. These were not things that existed before the field. So the progress is not simply a matter of texts, it is a matter of practice. The implementation of these measures around the world has made a very significant difference to tens of thousands of people, if not more. And it has also had uh, systemic effects. In a, uh, in a reconstructive spirit, I have argued that transitional justice has provided recognition to victims, not only as victims, but also as rights holders, that it has promoted civic trust, that it has the potential to strengthen the rule of law, and it has the potential to promote social integration or reconciliation. So these are not small achievements. And one could illustrate this with stories, both at the micro level of individuals that tell you, eh, I used to consider myself a victim, now I consider myself a citizen. At the meso level, by thinking about legislative reforms that, for instance, change the practices of the security forces. At the macro level, by constitutional reforms that have a huge impact, for example, by the introduction of constitutional courts, like the Colombian Constitutional Court, for instance, that has meant a tremendous amount of protection for Colombian citizens. So I think that this has, to a certain extent, worked. Now, my closing remarks. Now, of course, not everything is a cause for celebration. Quite aside from the fact that there are many ways of getting transitional justice wrong, including, for example, by establishing procedures that do not respect basic rule of law and due process requirements by using the measures as instruments of what I call turn-taking. I used to be on the downside, and now I get into power, and I will use transitional justice to benefit my friends. By politicizing transitional justice instruments, etc. Of the long list of, chal of challenges facing transitional justice today, I would like to concentrate first on three related ones, which I will mention in a single sentence. Transitional justice has become insufficiently attentive to context, it has become formulaic, and it has become technocratic. Now, let me disaggregate these critiques because although they are related, they can be analyzed uh, separately. First, attentiveness to context. Transitional justice, in a nutshell, developed in order to redress a particular set of violations in a particular set of conflict, namely the post-authoritarian uh, transitions of the Latin American Southern Cone. These were countries that were very broadly and very deeply institutionalized. And by that I mean that the institutions of the state had the capacity to make themselves present in every quarter of the state's territory. Didn't mean that they did, that they did so. It just meant that they could. Similarly, these were not uh, countries that suffered from huge legal vacuums. Most of the important topics in the interrelationship between citizens and the state were already regulated by means of law, which again, it doesn't mean that all the laws were equally wise, that they were effectively enforced, but again, the point is that these were not countries that suffered 
from huge legal vacuums. And the strength of the institutions also correlated with the crimes and the violations of which they were capable. Transitional justice, as we know it today, these four elements took shape in order to redress the typical violations that come about from the abusive exercise of state power. Now, most transitional justice work today is no longer done in contexts that can be characterized in that way. Most transitional justice work today is done in countries that are very weakly institutionalized, both horizontally and vertically. That means that state institutions are largely absent from huge swaths of the territories of the state. These are countries with huge legal vacuums in which neither the law nor courts nor anyone else has pronounced uh, himself or herself authoritatively on the relevant topics. And of course, where the violations that need to be redressed are totally unlike the violations that come about from the abusive exercise of strong institutions and resemble much more something akin to social conflagration. And I don't think that transitional justice has taken sufficiently on board those distinctions. Let me illustrate it in this way. When I presented my last report to the Human Rights Council, I ran numbers very rapidly about government income per capita through taxation at the moment when different countries went through their transitions. In 1990, when Chile went through the transition, the government received almost $600 per capita by means of uh, taxation. In 2002, when the Lomé Agreement was signed uh, for Sierra Leone, the government received more or less $48 per capita. In 2000, when uh, the agreement was born, uh, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement for Liberia was signed, the Liberian government received $12 per capita. In 2008, when the government of Afghanistan was in one of its many efforts to achieve a peace agreement, it received $8 per capita. So just in political economy terms, we are talking about completely different worlds. And now this is not an argument to say that justice is a good, a luxury that only the wealthy can afford. It is an argument both for the international community to make itself much more present in its delivery of justice and an argument for thinking about what is the proper model for protecting the rights of truth, justice, and reparations of people in contexts that are radically different from the contexts in which the model took shape. The second criticism that I made is that transitional justice has become a bit formulaic, and I will be very brief uh, about this. Organizational economists have a name for the tendency which I think applies to transitional justice. They call this isomorphic mimicry, the tendency to copy institutional forms and to assume that they work equally well regardless of the context in which they operate. This is a problem that afflicts not only transitional justice, perhaps the primary example of isomorphic mimicry in my mind is uh, anti-corruption commissions. Once the world came up with the idea of an anti-corruption commission, it simply replicated them everywhere as if culture made no difference, the, degree, the division between formal and informal parts of the economy was irrelevant, as if, for example, clan structures and family habits were totally irrelevant. This, of course, is nonsense. We know that there is no such thing as a universal policy tool. Uh, the fate of truth commissions in the transitional justice world is, from my standpoint, a very good example of isomorphic mimicry. 
we have to be much more flexible and much more attuned to the underlying questions that we are trying to resolve. How best to satisfy rights to truth, justice, and reparations, rather than how best to establish a truth commission. It may turn out that there are many places in which a truth commission is not the best vehicle for the promotion of the right to truth of victims, but despite ourselves and despite our claims that we do not have a cookie cutter approach, my experience is that we do have a cookie cutter approach. And that is something that we need to overcome. And finally, I think that transitional justice has become technocratic. It has over relied on solutions that are basically a question of clever institutional engineering. And the problem that transitional justice is trying to resolve is not simply a question of institutional design. So here to finish, I would like to recall the old sociological conviction that sustainable social transformation requires changes at the level of institutions, but also of culture and of personal dispositions. Transitional justice will be nothing more than a series of more or less isolated and more or less inconsequential events without socioeconomic transformations, but also without success in recovering a much stronger normative leverage that it used to have. Its instruments in general in, are very well suited for this purpose. More work on civil society, for example, these days, despite evidence about the wrongheadedness of these st uh, still reduced largely to NGOs, is crucial. For civil society has always played a crucial, indispensable role in transitions, well beyond uh, the role assigned to it in terms of monitoring, advocacy, and reporting. For me, the future of the past depends to a large extent on our ability to reoccupy a much more explicitly normative space where normativity is not reduced to either preaching or legalism. This also would include paying more attention to the levers of cultural transformations and the wellsprings of social solidarity and tolerance. This normative space, by the way, in many ways is also the space of guarantees of non-recurrence, of prevention, of which I have said little today, despite the fact that this was the topic that I devoted, to which I devoted most attention during my time as Special Rapporteur, also with uh, working with uh, Adam Adyeng. I did so on the conviction that this is the pillar of the mandate that if not from the standpoint of practice, certainly from the standpoint of doctrine, is the least developed element of transitional justice. Second, that it is here much more than anywhere else that the transformative potential of transitional justice can be realized, despite the fact that the discussions of prevention are also affected by technocratic reductionisms that need to be overcome. Third, that success at prevention is crucial for the sort of violations that transitional justice deals with, strictly speaking, can never be fully redressed. And finally, and I think that this is crucial, that the sort of principled pragmatism that I take to have been the underlying motivation of transitional justice can make an important contribution <coughs> to restoring human rights discourse and practice today. The human rights community, of which I take myself a part, of course, has contributed to allowing the discourse to become much more a tool of criticism uh, <coughs> than of protection, a blowhorn rather than a problem-solving strategy. 
taking prevention seriously would involve setting aside the sort of utopianism that we in the human rights community fall prey to so easily, utopianism that concentrates on describing desirable end states and on pointing how far away we are from attaining those end states, but that disengages completely from the task of providing answers to the question of how to get from here to there. The future of dealing with the past involves, as far as I am concerned, not the ritualistic sacralization of the past, but very deep reflection about the many ways in which even an examined past, but particularly a problematic and unredressed past, continues to manifest itself both in the present and in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, pa Thank you very much, Pablo. As always, inspiring. I took lots of notes, but um, it is now the time for our audience to uh, finally put questions. I'm sure that uh, there are many. Um, so I have the role to make sure that uh, uh, as many of you as possible have the chance to um, put forward your queries. Um, I just a note on the side, we are also collecting uh, questions on Twitter and uh, there is a team uh, behind the scenes that are collecting uh, those and will, uh, uh <laughs> so we won't, uh, we won't fall short of, uh, of questions, but please, um, the floor is with the audience. Okay, I'll take a couple of questions possibly from the three sides and then uh, we'll ask Pablo to, please. Thank you very much, Professor de Grey, for a fantastic lecture. Um, I was inspired by the uh, title of it, and uh, I have a question which relates to the present of human rights law, but also a little bit to the future. Currently, we more and more uh, involved in dealing with uh, complicated issues of accountability of non-state actors. And my question is, to what extent, as a matter of future of the transitional justice, also to find certain mechanisms to deal with these massive human rights abuses uh, made by uh, non-state actors, both territorially and extraterritorially? Thank you very much Thank again. You. Yes. Uh, I saw one. No, here then. Yes. Uh, yes. So I work with this. Thank you. I work with the Tamil diaspora organization from Sri Lanka. Of course, that would be particularly relevant to your work, having been at the forefront or involved at the most important moment when transitional justice was starting to be established. Um, and now that Sri Lanka is up for review again on the 20th, uh, the commissioner is giving of human rights is giving her report on the 8th and everything that's transpired over the past 10 years, especially the past week. Um, and I'll set that aside since we're short on time. Basically, my question is, given what I think is fair to say, failures of Sri Lanka to um, carry out or to deliver on their commitments in the two resolutions, what do you think it will take for the council to take the next step and really give thought or actually go forward with um, establishing an international justice mechanism or even referring Sri Lanka to the ICC as the international um, commissioner jurists um, recommended as one part of the possibilities. Okay, uh, here, perfect. Thank you so much for a really, really inspiring talk. 
Uh, for the last 25 years, I've been working in South Africa on economic reconstruction in the context of addressing transitional justice issues. And I wondered if perhaps um, you would be able to distinguish between two characterizations of economic attempts at solutions, one which sounded to me like addressing the actual, some of the root causes of conflict, um, and the other which sounded like throwing money at a problem. Perhaps you could help us untangle those. Thank you. Um, can, can we take a break and uh, Pablo will come back in, uh, in a few moments. I'll give him the chance to... So, uh, I will try to be short. I have the really bad tendency of giving long answers, but I will try to <laughs> moderate it by surely not doing full justice to the problems. And let me take them in reverse order. I think that there is a fundamental distinction between economic development programs writ large and the reparations programs uh, on the other. That reparations programs are not simply akin to, for example, crime insurance schemes. They, of course, involve an acknowledgement of uh, responsibility and that they distribute goods as a consequence that people deserve, not in virtue of the fact that they are citizens, like, for example, basic services, but in virtue of the fact that, that their rights were violated. Now, the uh, previous uh, government in, uh, in Sri Lanka, for example, tried, uh, and very explicitly saying it, uh, people are not interested in reparations, they are interested in development. Uh, this has been tried in many countries before, uh, and it never works. People are interested in uh, reparations. Not exclusively, not as the only form of justice, but it is one of the manifestations of redress that I think uh, many people express an interest in and that they deserve uh, as uh, a matter of right. So I think that there is uh, a distinction between uh, those two. This is not, of course, an argument about, uh, against uh, economic reconstruction. I have always been very keen on the idea of policy coordination. I have always been, generally speaking, for both theoretical and practical reasons, not so keen on policy centralization. So I think that it makes perfect sense to coordinate reparations policies with development programs, but that if a country wants, for instance, to redress economic imbalances, redistribute uh, funds uh, on behalf uh, of uh, the least advantaged. A reparations program is never the best vehicle for doing those. So countries are serious about development. They ought to use the tools that are designed and proven to achieve uh, developmental goals. And uh, the idea that this can be achieved uh, through transitional justice, I think, is a fantasy. There is no reparation program anywhere in the world that has had a sufficiently large budget to make an impact in the general distribution of wealth in a country. And therefore, I think that there is a fiction around this. I am much more sympathetic to the idea of saying the limited tasks for which transitional justice policies have been designed, let's make sure that every promise that we make, we deliver, rather than awaken expectations of victims without having any sense of whether we will be able to satisfy those. I think that there is a peculiar form of cruelty in awakening expectations on the part of people who have already suffered tremendously without any sort of analysis of whether we will be in a position to uh, satisfy the expectations that we have awakened uh, with them. So policy coordination is great. The expansion of the mandates of transitional justice measures 
keeping in mind that they are all generally politically weak, underfunded, ad hoc, and created on behalf of constituencies that are neither politically powerful nor politically popular. I think that one has to be realistic. This is the modesty that I was trying to suggest we in the transitional justice field uh, should uh, display. Now, this is, again, I realize only the beginning of a fuller answer. The, your question about uh, Sri Lanka, for me, is also very important because I ended up being very committed uh, to the case and uh, spending a great deal of time uh, to it. I think that there was, uh, uh, in, a, in many ways, a fundamental mistake in establishing a very, very uh, broad division of labor between those people who were discussing the constitutional reform on the one hand and people that were discussing the transitional justice uh, agenda on the other that uh, there, it first failed to recognize that there were very important connections between the two agendas. As far as I am concerned in Sri Lanka, it's going to be very, very difficult to make a headway without, for example, a very thorough reform of the Attorney General's office, which in Sri Lanka, like in many countries uh, with uh, English heritage, the Attorney General has the dual function of both advocacy of the state and uh, prosecutor, uh, but in a context in which uh, the former function overrides uh, the latter completely, but this is something that requires a constitutional reform, that in the long term it is going to be very difficult for transitional justice in the country to make headway without some serious uh, uh, security sector reform, which also requires a constitutional reform, and therefore it was a mistake to separate them. By the same token, I don't think that a constitutional reform that concentrated exclusively on issues having to do with devolution and therefore ignoring the perfectly legitimate grievances of uh, the Tamil population, uh, not to speak also of uh, other minority populations, was never going to be the full solution to the constitutional problem in uh, Sri Lanka. So there was a lot that could have been done in linking the two discussions. Here I have to say, the international community doesn't always play a very positive role. There were countless meetings organized with the support of the international community to discuss the constitutional reform issue without ever mentioning transitional justice, and equally countless uh, meetings organized by the international community to talk about transitional justice without saying anything about uh, transitional justice. Now, the idea that the Human Rights Council is going to be a sort of savior that will create uh, a special jurisdiction to solve the problems that in Sri Lanka it has been impossible to solve and with respect to which popularity and support has not increased at all. I frankly think that this is a bit of uh, an illusion that there is a lot of work that needs to be done still within the country and of course with the international community, but they hope that the, all the solutions will come from the council, I think is once again to set up people for huge, huge disappointment. And finally, on the question of uh, uh, the role of non-state actors, I think that this is an absolutely critical one. I had a list of, uh, the of themes when I was uh, trying to choose uh, the themes for the thematic uh, reports I had to present to the Council and to the General Assembly. And this was one of them, the role of non-state actors in uh, transitional justice. Uh, it is one that uh, touches uh, very close to my heart 
not because of the very, very large role uh, that non-state actors have played uh, in the conflict in Colombia and that played in the conflict in Colombia for probably not the, the full length of the, of, uh, the conflict, but almost. And uh, one of the mistakes in thinking that uh, transitional justice issues can be reduced uh, to the implementation of what international law says is that international law, for example, on this issue is largely silent. So there is a universe of work that still needs to be done at the normative level and uh, the, uh, the topic that you mentioned is one of those. I have uh, Miss Lewis, yes, and, uh, and then we have one question from uh, our tweets. Um, Miss Lewis, if Chris can uh, give you the... Um, would you say that there is a need of transitional justice in the criminal justice system of the United States, where in the past 10 years, a certain percentage of prison have become a public company so that the more prisoners there are, the more profitable it becomes. So that 20% of the population of the United States are people of color, black and Latino, but 60% of the inhabitants in prison are blacks and Latino. And aside from that, they are, being, they are working at $1 per hour for companies that are you know, making money. So is there a need for transitional justice in that situation? With China playing an increasingly central role in, in uh, international affairs and the international system, what do you think the implications are of China having at least so far in some ways, quote unquote, successfully suppressed the memory um, or the, the real, current realization of the memory of the 50 million or so people who died as a result of Mao's policies? And then if I can read you what we received. Uh, how can we continue to move forward and incorporate women into, as well as lead, transitional justice processes? And what do you consider the lessons learned? Thank you very much. Oh, oh, I will take them this set in the order that were her post. Uh, I think that there is something that uh, well-established, uh, consolidated democracies can learn from transitional justice experiences, and that there is some use in the implementation of transitional justice measures for what is called uh, historical injustices, inju injustices in the long uh, past. However, I think that, the, again, part of my worry about the current state of transitional justice is that its promoters have tended to think that the very, very same formula will work equally well regardless of uh, circumstances. The injustices that you are describing are of course injustices that deserve to be red redressed and I am totally convinced that this is a country that has a long way to go in reckoning with its own racist past. Whether the proper mechanism for doing that is the mechanisms that we have learned through transitional justice experiences or not, I actually have some reservations. But the idea of the reckoning is something about which I have absolutely no doubt. And I am talking both about the historical injustices in the deep past, which in fact had not just consequences that are manifested today, but had legal manifestations that manifested themselves until quite recently, for example, in terms of redlining, of real estate, lending practices on parts of the bank, etc., etc. I am also talking about 
very, very recent events, like, uh, for example, at one point, uh, Senator Leahy had uh, uh, discussed uh, the possibility of establishing a commission of inquiry to investigate uh, the rendition programs that the, the USA had promoted uh, and in which many European countries participated. The Open Society Institute, for example, has a brilliant report uh, on this issue. I think that had that initiative uh, been followed in the last election, making torture a campaign issue would have been significantly more difficult uh, than it was. So, again, I take some solace from the fact that at some point a reckoning is inevitable. How that reckoning is done, I think that we should be much more flexible in the way that we implement and design measures, taking into account what has been learned in other countries, which is more or less the answer that I would like uh, to give uh, uh, to you concerning China. It may surprise you, it certainly surprised me every time that I experienced it. There was no occasion in which I presented a report to the Human Rights Council or the General Assembly, which usually included a small section on the importance of history education, because as I mentioned, uh, I think that we should not work solely at the level of institutional designs, but also at the level of culture and the personal dispositions. There was no time in which I made this argument in either chamber in which the Chinese delegation did not ask for the floor to express their emphatic agreement with me about the importance of history education. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, finally, on uh, the question of uh, women and gender, uh, I think that we have come a long way. Look, in the first uh, few truth commissions, they were gender blind in the worst possible sense, no? Not that they protected equally the interests and the rights of men and women. No one ever thought about uh, the rights and the uh, interests of women in uh, the first uh, truth commissions, uh, for example. But we have made uh, huge strides in that respect. The Peruvian Truth and Reconciliation Commission was the first to include uh, a, gen a specialized uh, gender unit in order to mainstream in the work of the commission gender considerations. The Moroccan Truth Commission, one may be surprised. The first meeting I had with the plenary of that commission, which incidentally had 16 men and one woman, I asked them, what are your initial thoughts about how the commission should address uh, gender crimes? And uh, the, one of the commissioners, a man obviously, raised his hand and said, Monsieur de Grave, we are a Muslim country, we have no such problems here. <laughs> to which I said, I am not a Moroccan specialist, but if what you are telling me is true, this would make out of Morocco a total outlier in uh, countries that have experienced uh, systematic human rights abuses. That was the starting point. The end point, however, was an incredibly progressive uh, uh, reparations program uh, for women, departing, for example, from uh, uh, Sharia dictates about inheritance and distribution of funds uh, to women, taking very, very seriously the rights, not just of female victims, but of female family members that deserved compensation. So the point is, but I am far from saying that we have done everything that we can in terms of the proper integration of uh, gender considerations in transitional justice work, but I think that we have come a long way and that we need much more than innovation right now is better implementation and much, much better outreach. 
Pablo, I take um, advantage of this position to ask, uh, uh, you know, to, to lead you towards the closing uh, of this wonderful session we had together. Of the many things you said, I took note of two that uh, spoke very uh, loudly to me. The first is the concept of determination. You know, we honor the family that has made contribution for humanity here. And, uh, and in the work we do, we witness that every day, the determination of a group of individuals that take upon themselves the defense and the advance of justice for all those that, were, that suffered. And South Africa was mentioned, for example. We have seen only a couple of weeks ago a formal recognition from state authorities that prosecution was blocked purposely, even though South Africa represents what we consider a successful transition, right? At least to a certain extent. So this concept of determination, and that goes hand in hand with the other thing that really struck me of your lecture. When addressing the past becomes possible, when the violations and the legacies becomes unbearable. Now, we are in a time when can we really say that violations are unbearable? How can we make the, their weight and their uh, effect felt by all? How can we make sure that there is a critical mass of individuals that stand up and start fighting with those few that show this great determination? Thank you, Anna Miriam. Uh, I wish that I had uh, the recipe, of course, but uh, let me make uh, the, the following uh, uh, comments. I mean, I mentioned in my brief intervention, perhaps uh, too cryptically, that I am very, very interested in the relationship between institutions, culture, and individual dispositions. I take the history of Latin American constitutionalism, for example, constitutions that were formally perfect. There is uh, the story of uh, Victor Hugo, the French author, being shown a draft of the Colombian 1886 constitution. He's reading them and coming back and saying, this is the constitution of a republic of angels. Now, knowing something about Colombian history, you will see the deep dissonance between the formal perfection of the text and the reality that it actually failed to norm, to regulate for so long. So the history of Latin American constitution Oh, constitutionalism for me is the long history of the struggle to establish closer links between the formal texts and uh, a cultural and an individual reality that needed to go hand in hand with uh, the institutional uh, design. I think that the period that we are living through is uh, a very interesting test case for that precisely. If one thinks, for example, about the situation in the United States, it is not that the institutions have changed, at least formally. There has been no constitutional reform in this country. What has apparently happened was that there is a cultural shift going on, to some extent a shift in personal dispositions away from tolerance and uh, solidarity. And then the question is how to make sure that once again we establish a minimum, a sustainable relationship between those three spheres. I know no transitional uh, process that has worked except for the demand of civil society. I have never met a country, a government, that has spontaneously said, great, now we are going to do the uh, right thing spontaneously. No, governments are brought there. They do not get there by their own volition. 
And therefore, the question for me today is, what can be done in order to strengthen civil society? And I think that there are several things uh, to be said about this. The model of NGOs, we have reduced uh, civil society to NGOs. That is a developmental model that I think is finding its limits. Uh, we no longer have powerful uh, trade unions, uh, for example, which in every transition that I know of have played an absolutely indispensable role. This is true not just of the old uh, transitions in Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay. This is true of the recent transitions in Tunisia. The Tunisian labor union started the work for the transition long before the revolution started. We no longer have religious organizations that get involved significantly in uh, transitional issues, although, again, in most transitions, including the critical ones in Poland and the Central and Eastern European countries, solidarity was both a labor movement and a religious organization. So the first thing that we, I think, need to do is to recover a richer sense of civil society. And we need to spend much more time thinking about how to strengthen that. Now, I, of course, recognize both the theoretical and the practical reasons why civil society, in being by its very nature independent of the state, it does not respond, not respond to policy making as if it were a part of the state. But beyond repealing the laws that limit the operation of civil society, there is a lot that we can do, and I think that it's a huge failure of imagination on our part not to do more of that. I'm going to use a term that is totally foreign to my academic background, but that I think is apt in this context. Civil society should be, and traditionally was, a sort of ecosystem. It included organizations of very, very different kinds. Civil society today is NGOs. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work. We need much more than that. And I think that a comprehensive prevention policy, and this is something that I had the benefit of working when uh, the council asked me to work with Adama on transitional justice uh, and prevention. Things like education, promoting the role of uh, religious leaders, a memorialization <coughs> activities, and the promotion of culture writ large, cultural interventions, I think will eventually be critical in order to recover sources of solidarity and tolerance, and at the same time, empower the demands for justice without which the future of the past is really, really grim. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>